Hello everyone, welcome to another Voice Essentials live hangout. So good to spend the next uh, 50 minutes or so with you and I hope you've had or are having a good weekend. Many of you are still in the process of finishing your weekend of course. We're well into um, the next week as it were and uh, I can tell you it's a pretty good week so you've got something to look forward to if you haven't yet started your Monday. Um, it's so good to have you. If you, you're replaying this video, you're also welcome. Of course, we do these live hangouts every Monday uh, at 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And the way to know about those is to make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the white bell icon, and then you'll always know when we're going live. And uh, But of course, welcome to those of you who are already watching this live right now I can see many of you in the chat it's good to have Karen from Singwise and Linda and Nye and Matt and you uh, all the regulars joining in you guys are in for such a treat today this is going to be um, I've been looking forward to this um, for quite some time we have got uh, someone who I really respect and, and admire uh, on the channel with us. It's a real thrill for me personally, but I know it's going to be uh, so informative for you, for those of you who are wanting to learn contemporary vocals. Uh, Dr. Matthew Edwards, Associate Professor Matthew Edwards, is uh, one of the world's leading uh, contemporary uh, vocal pedagogues, and uh, he's going to be joining us in a moment. Before we do get into it, just a little a few uh, news items that I just wanted to let you know. Uh, I've been letting you know that oh, we've got a, n a new big video coming out and I had slated it to go live June 13. I'm excited because I think we're going to be able to go live with it this Wednesday. So Wednesday the 20, will that be the 20, the 30th of May. Um, so keep an eye out if it doesn't, for some reason, unforeseen circumstance doesn't go live this week, it will go live next. So make sure you jump on. This video is about how the singing voice works. And I've worked really hard with my animator, Julia, to really hopefully make a highly accessible video, an easily understood video that will explain how your voice works, um, but also in anatomically correct language and uh, and I know I, I seriously know you're going to get so much out of it so please make sure you watch it watch it right through to the end and then share it on your social networks help me out let's get the word out about this video I think it's going to be helpful to a lot of people uh, the second piece of news just want to let you know some of you are aware that I have in the past been a part of a, a summer school for the last five years in fact I've taught uh, voice at a summer school uh, in Toowoomba and uh, I've just recently made a decision to step away from doing that. Um, the school is going in a direction that um, I think someone else would be better served uh, to do voice for them uh, up there so I've made a decision to step away. Uh, it coincides with the fact that I'm actually going skiing in Japan with my brother-in-law for his 40th so that was kind of not a hard decision uh, but nonetheless uh, it will be good to see um, one of my colleagues actually, Renee, she's going to be teaching up there this year and she's going to do an outstanding job. And uh, so if you hadn't thought you were going to go to the summer school, maybe you've been saving your pennies. Um, look, it, it, not all is lost. Renee is awesome and uh, you'll be in good hands. But just wanted to let you know I won't be doing it this year. Uh, thirdly, one more thing. As you know, we are in production for the second exercise CD, Voice Essentials, hashtag two. I don't know whether that's, that's a working title. We'll see. <laughs> I think it's just going to be Voice Essentials 2. Really creative, Daniel. Um, and uh, it's going to have a whole heap of intermediate exercises. It started out as only being 12 tracks. It's grown to 17 tracks. This is going to be jam-packed, full of intermediate level exercises that... Um, I know you're going to benefit from and we had a, pr a production meeting on Saturday. I'm really, I'm, I'm growing in my excitement around it. So I'll keep you up to speed with when that uh, is going to be available to you. Um, uh, early indications are sometime in August. We'll see. I'll keep you up to speed with that. 
So there you go. That's what we um, some news for you. Um, now, don't forget uh, as our conversation goes along today, I want you to ask your questions. We're going to have a quick Q and A at the end, and uh, and uh, uh, Linda is going to be collating your questions um, into a word uh, uh, an online doc for me, and I'm going to be able to ask some of your questions of Dr. Uh, Edwards in a moment, <clears throat> and um, and so start asking your questions in the live chat if you're following along. If you're doing this as a replay, um, I will be able to answer your questions in the comments section below the video. So don't hesitate ever to ask your questions if you're watching the video in replay. But for now, I think we should just get into it because we want to give as much time as we possibly can to Dr. Matthew Edwards. We'll be right back after this. Sound check. Check one, check two. Hello, Dr. Matthew Edwards. It's so good to have you. Or do we? Is it proper to call you Associate Professor Edwards? Uh, you can just call me Matt. It's <laughs> okay. fine. Very good. Well, I, um, you know, I, I'm happy to go by Dan as well. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for um, being a part of um, today's program. And uh, I, I read this book here. Um, let me just give a nice good close-up. This is So You Want to Sing Rock and Roll. Um, I got a hold of this, I think, when it first came out because I was so excited. I was, oh, thank goodness, a high-level pedagogue's writing on the subject. And uh, do you know what? I was not disappointed. It is, and I have been raving about this text and referencing it on all of my videos. And I think even one in one video I referred to myself as a fanboy. Uh, because it is, it just resonated so strongly with me. Tell us, tell us how it is that you came to write a book like this. What, what led you to that? Well, I have a, an odd background, I think, to me to get into this place of teaching rock and roll, especially in a university setting. Um, when I was in school, in high school, I played in a rock band. Uh, my dream was to be a rock star. Uh, my dad thought I needed to go to college. He had different ideas for me. Um, so I, it kind of got into this struggle of figuring out, am I going to be a rock star or go to college? And I saw that you can major in vocal performance. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll get to go, you know, to college to become a rock star. And when I got to school, I found out that it wasn't about learning how to sing rock and roll. It was about learning how to sing classical music. And while I enjoyed classical music and I had been singing that, uh, you know, in high school and solo and ensemble <clears throat> contests, I didn't quite understand what I was getting myself into. But at the same time, I started to really like it. And um, I did an opera within the first, you know, semester of school starting. And I started realizing that my bass voice, I have this bass baritone voice that fit really well in the opera world. Whereas when I was trying to sing Pearl Jam and Nirvana, it didn't always hit those high notes quite the way that I wanted to. And so I started kind of going down that operatic path and I ended up transferring to a school called the Cleveland Institute of Music, which had a really high level opera training program. Uh -huh. And um, so I was there and I really started getting totally focused on classical as the way to go and other ways of using my voice were, you know, a waste of my talent. Then I got to grad school and I had a full assistantship where I was, you know, performing and singing and doing some teaching. And I went and did a summer stock gig and uh, I was told I'd have some extra time. So I took my guitar along and I started playing guitar. Uh, you know, I used to write songs in high school. And so I started kind of playing around with songwriting a little bit again. Uh, we had to be in a musical. If you were in the opera, you were also going to do a musical. It was Fiddler on the Roof. Um, I kind of resisted because I thought, you know, I had just spent all these years at the conservatory learning that my voice was better than that. But then I got into the show and I realized I actually enjoyed being in the musical more because really my roots of the things that got me interested in voice were theater and high school, which included musicals and rock and roll. And so I started playing my guitar more that summer and started trying to go back to my roots and singing some of the rock stuff that I always loved. And it wasn't working so well. I got back to Louisiana where I was in a grad school and there was a songwriting contest and I recorded a song and I sent it in. Before I sent it in, though, I played it for my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And so, um, so I had to it and I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what I think of this and what it sounds like. And she listened and she was very kind. I was like, well, it's, it's okay. And we both were like, 
trying to just figure out how it was that, you know, I was singing so well operatically, but then when I went to go sing rock and roll, it sounded terrible. I was better in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to sing some contemporary musical theater stuff. And again, it wasn't good. It didn't sound right. And so I had a voice pedagogy course that semester. And I started learning about science and voice science. Now in high school, I ran as far away from science as possible. I had like D's and F's. Um, I was not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but all of a sudden I found a way that science could inform something that I cared a lot about and it could possibly make me better at it. And so I dove in and I started discovering that there were people talking about musical theater voice training and talking about rock voice training. And so I started really uh, reading everything that I could and trying to figure out what it was that I was missing. And I started this path of self-discovery where I, uh, you know, started playing with everything I read and started noticing that, wow, these are really different styles of singing. And that the classical training I was receiving, while it was great for that style of music, didn't do anything to help me with the rock and roll or the musical theater that I really wanted to perform. Mm. And so I started working with students and uh, teaching them the things that I was learning and working with them on their music and it just snowballed and from there i started um you know working with recording artists i was working in uh we moved from louisiana up to upstate new york where i was a resident artist with an opera company but my next door neighbor owned a recording studio in town that had a bunch of new york city artists who come up and uh, record because it was so much cheaper in upstate new york we had a lot of regional artists i was working with them i ended up getting an adjunct job teaching musical theater and then i would go and perform in the opera in the evening and then all of a sudden there was this job posting that I saw at uh, Shenandoah Conservatory where they wanted an opera singer with musical theater experience to teach rock and roll. <laughs> and I was like, hey, that's me. Um, I'm not sure that they really thought that they would find that person, but they found me. Maybe, maybe and, they were, uh, maybe they were hoping here. they wouldn't find that person. I wonder. I think back then at first, maybe they were, but uh, it's a great, we, uh, you know, we all get along great here and now, and it's a wonderful environment to teach, but you know, it was a different time. It was nine years ago and nine years ago, there was still some debate as to how contemporary musical theater was going to go. And a lot of people thought that rock and roll was going to be a fad. Uh -huh. And it's proven now that rock and roll on Broadway is not a fad. This is the way that the world is going. And whereas, you know, training even nine years ago, there was still a lot of uh, emphasis on more of that acoustic uh, projected musical theater singing voice. Today, you look at what's happening in shows like Waitress. When you listen to Jesse Mueller singing, it's this breathy, intimate quality. We're moving away from the days of trying to acoustically project at the back of the hall. Um, so that started then getting me working with teaching rocks, how taking musical theater uh, performers at Shenandoah and trying to teach them how to sing rock and roll, which meant that I really had to dive in and dissect everything to help them understand why things were different. And as I started working uh, with them, I started you know, creating uh, handouts that I would put together. I started writing up some things to pass along uh, to my students. And then I started getting the idea that maybe I'll write a book sometime. Well, I was at a conference and Alan Henderson, who's the executive director of Nats, came up to me and said, hey, we're starting a book series called So You Want to Sing, and we're thinking about having you write the rock and roll book. It would be the second book in the series. And I was like, yeah, that's funny. Nats is going to write a rock and roll book. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll write it. <laughs> and then I went and talked to my wife and I said, I had the strangest conversation. Nats is going to write a book about rock and roll and they want me to write it. I was like, we'll see if that happens, because that seems like a big shift for Nats, because Nats when I was in college was always very classical and they've been shifting and shifting and shifting. But for them to endorse a book on rock and roll pedagogy seemed to me like a huge leap. And then I got the contract and I realized, wow, they're serious. It's, it's happening. And um, so, yeah, so we wrote the book <laughs> and the So You Want to Sing book series has taken off like a rocket. And I have just been so impressed by the things that they have, uh, Nats has been putting yeah. out there and you know the progress and they're really pushing the conversation forward and being a leader in this field to get us to start teaching all of these styles with uh training that is very specific to the needs yeah. of those performers yeah and in fact that gives us a good segue to say that there's a new one out so yours came out in 2014 if i'm remembering correctly 
Yeah. Um, and and this this one is just literally it's hot off the press, isn't it? It's only just yeah. come out um, called "So You Want to Sing CCM Contemporary Commercial Music," um, and uh, it's been edited by Matthew Hock, who uh, is a highly respected writer within. Um, the field of vocal pedagogy, and you've you've contributed a number of chapters to this as well, Matthew. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you yeah. Just... So I've got a chapter in there. It's uh, it talks about commercial music versus music theater. So yeah. we use this term, especially in the United States, of contemporary commercial music, and that term helped really define styles <clears throat> as uh, before. Then people were calling them non-classical styles. Yeah. Right. And there's a voice pedagogue named Jeannie Lavetri, and she always would say, we don't call a cat a non-dog. So why are we <laughs> calling, you know, rock and roll and musical theater singing yeah. non-classical? Yeah. Don't call it what it's not. Call it what it is. Certainly. Right? And so this term is now what we use in the United States. But the problem is, is I think that a lot of times people think that they're all the same. Yeah. That rock and roll and musical theater, well, that's all CCM. And so it's the ba same basic techniques. Yeah. And yeah. So that there it starts to lay out that no they're actually quite different and it starts to kind of lay out well these are the things that you need to think about when working with rock and roll or pop or country or r&b versus these things for music theater and my goal is is to shift the conversation with that chapter away from classical versus ccm to classical and rock and pop and r&b and music theater etc yeah yeah because and i think then, there's a well-established thought isn't there around the, the all-encompassing umbrella term of classical voice but within classical you've got baroque you've got opera you've got renaissance you've got um you know you that you can divvy that up and they've all got different stylistic and no doubt technical approaches um the same is with within the contemporary genres um yeah yeah absolutely i mean and, and you know the rock voice evolved with instrumentation yeah. And so back in the early days of Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, they were playing with more of a clean guitar sound. Then we start getting into bands like Led Zeppelin. And as that guitar is starting to get amped up, you hear the voice get edgier and edgier. Yeah. Then when we get into Metallica in the 80s and yeah. we have these thrash guitars, the voice is really getting edgy to match that thrash guitar sound. Yeah. yeah. And then now today we have singer songwriters writing for piano and voice or acoustic guitar and voice, ukulele and voice. Yeah. And then we have people making music on their MacBook at home and digitizing everything. Yeah. And so the voice needs to be able to adapt to the instrumentation that's with it. And that requires different approaches. And yeah. if a microphone is sitting three inches in front of your mouth, that requires a whole different approach than if you're in an opera uh, house trying to perform for 1500 people with no mic. Absolutely, and and uh, we were talking before the show today, and and I was saying just you know how strongly um, I resonated with with what you're writing because here on YouTube I've made you know I've come under fire a little bit for being so I guess um, unapologetic for making that that very clear distinction between the technical underpinnings of the different and the, and the to what I see as being significant not only acoustical differences but mechanical the mechanical drive of the voice and the way we set up uh the mechanics of the voice do you want to talk to that a little bit perhaps and and give us um some some take on your views as to the differences that we see in the the structural makeup or the setup of the of the voice contemporary compared to classical <clears throat> yeah well it's what you said they're different and there's science to back that up yeah. and it's <clears throat> You know, in the field of medicine, we don't do things uh, with patients the same way that we did in the 19th century, thankfully. Because <laughs> if we did, we'd have a lot of problems. You know, treating everything with yeah. leeches would be really bad. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, in the world of voice training, we tend to look at these great teachers of the 19th century, people like uh, Manuel Garcia, and we hold them up as the pinnacle of teaching. And then we act like things that have happened since then are not as valid. And I think that's a really backwards way of looking. It doesn't mean we throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we don't get rid of all of those traditions from, you know, the classic pedagogues, but we need to take the new understandings of the voice and use that information to improve our training. Yeah. And what we're finding is exactly what you said. Acoustically, the resonance strategies used by rock singers and belters are very different than what classical singers use to get their voice to cut over top of an orchestra. 
And we know that those resonance strategies involve movement of the larynx, the way that the soft palate moves, the way that the tongue moves, the hump of the tongue, whether it's more forward or flat or you know, retracting backwards, and the lips, whether they're round or spread. All those things affect the acoustic output of the voice. And what we're learning on the other side in motor learning research is that your brain has to have um, dedicated work to learn a new skill. And so if you're only working on Italian vowels and you're training that motor system to round everything out, and then yeah. you expect the person's going to just jump over and sing Rock of Ages, yeah. it's not going to be possible because their motor system is going to be confused. Muscle memory, and, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, you know, definitely on the acoustic sides, there is a researcher uh, in California who took EMG needles, and they're needles that they stick through the neck into the thyroid arytenoid muscle and the cricothyroid muscle to measure the uh, maximum amount of muscle activation yeah. in the various registers. And what they found is that both muscles are involved in chest, chest mix, head mix, and head, so that even when you're up in that head voice, you have some thyroid muscle activity. Yeah. Well, what that tells us is that if you're not training both muscles, you're setting your body up for failure. Yeah. Right? If you yeah. have to use both muscle groups throughout the range, we need to be training both of them. Yes. But there are some more traditional or classic approaches where we focus on a head down approach to everything. Yes. And yes. that basically isolates just that cricothyroid muscle. And if you are not counterbalancing that by working on the thyroid arytenoid muscle, you're going to get an imbalanced system. Yeah. And then the singers, and I just had one come to me this last week to work, who is primarily trained head down, can't figure out why she can't belt. And the answer is because you've never approached those muscles. You haven't coordinated them to do what you need to do, and you haven't strengthened them to do what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's so good to hear some, someone else say it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, and that's the, you know, and that's where I say it's again, it's like the science is useful for us when we can use that and yeah. start making sense of these things that we have kind of discovered within ourselves that are different. Well, why is that different? And we yeah. can go back to the research and find out that we're not just making this up. Yeah. That, you know, other people have found these things too. Yeah. And I, I was letting people know, I think it was uh, last week or maybe the week before here on the live channel that I've got a, a new video coming up um, sometime. It, it'll release sometime in June where I review an article by, um, by Matthew Hock and uh, Mary J. Sundage. Uh, and they're um, talking about, um, now I'm going to forget the name of it, but they're talking about the physiology. Um, it's not coming to me, but. They're talking about basically, you know, things like the overload principle, task specific, you know, musculature response, all of these things that mm -hmm. sports science. And this is where this is sort of the angle I've been coming on, coming at it from for a while. Sport, we're behind sports science. Sports science have known this for, for quite some time now and and recognizing that if they want an elite footballer to, to develop, you know, in their particular craft, their particular sport, you don't just go and put them in a pool and have them swimming laps all day and vice well, versa for a swimmer, you know, a, 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 there may well be some, in fact, there would be advantage by a, an, advan an elite footballer doing some laps in a pool, but he's, that's not going to be the dominant aspect of his training. Um, as it is not going to be for a swimmer, her, her dominant aspect of training is not going to be spent you know, running laps out on a football field. And it's, it's something that sports science, I think, have, have just got ahead of us. And we're starting to catch up, which I, I think is very exciting. This is, uh, you know, the new field, the new push, which is excellent. Well, in the sports is a, a great analogy. My colleague here is Shenandoah, Dr. David Meyer. He's the head of our uh, Voice Research Center. And what he says is that if you look at high school athletes today, we have high school athletes beating records set at the first Olympics, right? Yeah. yeah. Humans didn't magically evolve over that short period of time. Yeah. What evolved was the training. Yeah. And we started using better training based on science. And now we have people achieving those monumental tasks earlier in life. Yeah. And there's no reason we can't be doing the same thing for singers by using science to our advantage. Absolutely.
Let's let's. Uh, I just want to get, come back to something that you you kind of touched on earlier, and and that is the the role of technology, the role of audio amplification, um, and 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 uh, I think I'm I'm right in, um, or, or, or certainly where I first came into contact with your writing was you were writing. I forget where it was now, but you were writing about or um, you know tech uh, audio aspects of, of singing for rock or whatever. I forget where it was. It was an article somewhere. Um, yeah. And uh, let, I wonder if you want to just, you know, play that out a little for us. And because that area is, is so quickly evolving, even down to the fact that we've got, you know, some great technologies around loop pedals and those sorts of things that singers can access. Now, what have you observed in the last, dare I say, 25 years of, of singing? Well, yeah, I mean, so what you said is the technology is more readily available to people than ever before. Yeah. And with, uh, you know, now as, you know, microprocessors keep getting better and better, we have these portable effects units where you used to have to go to a recording studio to get all of that available to you. And so now people are writing songs with some of these digital effects in mind. So it's an extension of their instrument. And this is where people sometimes, I think, uh, we can get into great debates about whether that's cheating, whether that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It's art. People have debated whether art was good or bad forever. It's happening. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily like that style of music. But as a teacher, I look at it as my duty to help those people. And if they want to use a lot of audio enhancement to create a signature sound, then so be it. Let's work with it. Yeah. Um, with it being more readily available, um, in-ear monitor quality has improved drastically. Uh, I also think it's important for people who are just getting started off playing in a garage band, getting together with friends, is to pick up a cheap microphone setup. You know, if you're performing with a band, a drum set can be playing at 130 decibels. I have yet to see a study that clocks a singer at 130 decibels. Right. Most singers, if you look at uh, studies of rock singers and Broadway singers, they'll be in the 90s, maybe peak into like 105, 110. So it's impossible for you to oversing that drum set. Yeah. And one of the ways people get hurt is when they get on stage, they can't hear themselves. So they start pushing more and more. You're never going to overcome all the stage noise and then they get worn out. Whereas yeah. if they have a good microphone and a good monitor, there's some research that says that auditory feedback, being able to hear yourself clearly, makes you work less. Yeah. Right. It comes yeah. out of classroom teachers, and uh, you know, so we should be taking advantage of that, especially yeah. with high school students, and especially with people who are new to this. If you've never, you know, really been performing before, and all of a sudden you're trying to jump into a 45-minute set, use the mic to your advantage. You know, and then once you get to the point that you're trying to, you know, build a reputation and you're singing three hour, uh, you know, sets or three hour gigs, make sure that you're using the monitors and the microphones so that you can make it through that time. Then yeah. when you want to go into the recording studio and just let it rip, go for it. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the cultural challenges, I think, that we have when it comes to uh, developing singers as, is that. At the access into starting to sing is free for the vast majority of the world's population. We're all born with the instrument. And yeah. um, I'm a great advocate for, you know, it is the birthright of every human being to sing. Of course, we can then start to layer um, expertise, you know, layers of expertise upon that and we can start to craft the instrument. The challenge, though, is that unlike many other instruments where the accessibility is not so readily um, available. So for example, if you want to learn to play the guitar, you first must buy a guitar. Yeah. And, and so you've got immediately you've got a dollar entrance fee just to, just to start to play. Whereas when, with singing, there's no dollar entrance free, fee. It is free to start. But that unfortunately births a, an attitude of this learn to sing thing doesn't require the expenditure of money. And I'm such a strong advocate of encouraging, particularly uh, singers who want to take their voice into, you know, to a level where they're able to perform uh, regularly, 
is for them to buy their own equipment because guitarists, drummers, piano players, keyboardists are all spending dollar. And I think we as singers need to be ready to spend dollar, not only on equipment, but on lessons. That's another, another story. Uh, but to see people starting to spend some dollar on, on decent equipment, which only serves, as you say, and this is where I want to come back to you, only serves to better the health uh, and sustainability of their voice. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's critical. You're right. Because if you don't invest something into the training and the equipment to make sure that you, uh, you know, can effectively perform, you could lose it real quick and get yeah. voice salmon. And if yeah. you think lessons are expensive or equipment's expensive, try a surgery with the top doctors who actually aren't going to mess oh. you up. And uh, absolutely. You know? And, and not only, I mean, in, in the States, that would definitely be the case. And in Australia, that too is, is, is the case. How, I mean, prevention is so much better than cure, right? Yeah. <laughs> and cheaper. Uh, yes. But, but and it not... doesn't mean that you're not, and what I always tell people is it's not about giving up a certain part of your sound. You don't have to give up growling or yeah. doing scream. Yeah. You just need to figure out a way to do them that is less likely to get you injured. Absolutely. You know, it's like football players, they go do stretches and they, you know, <laughs> uh, weight train and other things to make it less likely they're going to get injured. Yeah. So if you want to, and that's an extreme sport. If yeah. you want to do extreme singing like death metal, yeah, you need to be learning things to make it less likely that you're going to get injured. Yeah. Right. You yeah. still might because it's part of the risk. Just like going and playing football, there is some risk that something's going to happen to you. Yeah. But we can definitely reduce that risk through training and through making sure that you have, you know, the right equipment. And equipment goes beyond just the microphones as well. It goes to making sure that you're staying hydrated that you're taking care of your diet and making sure yeah. that, you know, uh, as you travel, you have uh, humidifiers or steamers, things yes. to make sure that, yes. you know, the air around you is helpful to the vocal mechanism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. hundred uh, percent. And, and uh, I think what we're talking about here, I, I just want to, because I'm, I'm just watching time and I do want to give some time at the end to some Q and A. So just one yeah. more thing I want to, I want to take, the, the opportunity to talk with you is because we're talking about voice damage at the moment a, a, as we are and and one of the I think challenges around um, contemporary vocals is the mistake has been made in my humble opinion of the moment we're able to observe someone whose voice has succumbed to, to voice damage or in what in some um, texts uh, is being referred to as vocal disturbance uh, which I hate that term but anywho um, uh, and that is that, you know, we immediately say, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the genre, you know, it's the, it's the technique or it's the lack thereof. And it may well be the lack thereof, but, you know, I, I, I wonder what your thoughts are, are around, um, I lean more, especially when we're talking about elite vocalists who are spending a lot of time using their voice. I wonder what you, your thoughts are around the idea of vocal load and the amount of vocal load some of these voices are having to carry. Yeah, well, that's definitely part of the issue. Um, if you look at a typical opera singer's schedule, they may sing seven to eight performances in a month, and that's a great month. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then if you look at a touring rock band, yes. they could be playing, you know, four nights a week. Well, now you're looking at at least 16 performances, double yep. the amount of performances. Double. Yep. Right. And then in between those performances, they're in a bus, in a hotel, on a plane. Whereas your opera singer singing at the Metropolitan Opera gets to basically be in one city and they can adapt and do their performances while they're yeah. there. Yeah. The people who may have it the worst are the musical theater people who are performing eight shows a week. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So they're getting up on stage 32 times a month doing a show. Yeah. So vocal load is, you know, something that I think is often neglected and yeah. you cannot compare apples to apples. No. Saying that, well, classical is much healthier because they don't get injured as much is first of all false. There has been some research that's being done out of um, the conservatory here in the States by Dr. Wendy LaVorn. And she's finding that of the voice performance, which in the United States is classical, uh, majors and the musical theater majors in coming into that program, it's around one third of them on both sides have some sort of a vocal pathology or yeah. vocal injury. Yeah. Right. 
So it's equal. It's not different. Yeah. Opera singers tend to hide and they don't bring it up as much. Yeah. I've sung with plenty of people. I was in a company at one point in time where there was four people who were dealing with a voice injury. They had, mm-hmm. you know, nodules or pre nodule swelling of mm-hmm. some sort. Mm-hmm. But there's a stigma around it, which is really sad because I think that if we could remove that stigma, we could help that population even more. Absolutely. You know, and then yeah. it becomes real obvious in the commercial world. Well, because in the opera world, if you need to take a month off, to reheal or a couple months off, that's normal. We see a singer schedule with multiple months off. Yeah. But if you're in a Broadway show or a touring show, you can't just take some months off. And if you're Adele and you have to cancel and cost a lot of people millions of dollars, people are going to know. Yeah. And, and this is the thing, isn't it? I, I, that word stigma, there is still so much stigma applied. We don't, we don't apply the same sig- stigma to uh, an elite athlete whose knee breaks down because yeah. of their training schedule or what have you. And we had a, one of our very famous hurdlers here in Australia, uh, Sally Pearson, the world record holder, etc., had to pull out of the Commonwealth Games um, just recently because I think it was her ankle, um, it might have been something else, had broken down. Now, um, you don't, we don't suddenly go, oh, well, Sally, she's, her technique's terrible and... You know, she's really no, not very good at all. And, you know, there's none of that. And yet when it comes to singers, the moment their voice breaks down and, and, you know, in the case of Adele, she came under some significant fire. And I think much of it was driven by stigma. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, oh, uh, we, could, we could continue to talk about this for quite some time. And I think, and that's, you know, what I, what you said, which I, I uh, love is that everybody is born with a voice and everybody can learn to use it. Yeah. And I think the other thing that sometimes gets people injured is they try to make their voice fit something that it's not designed to do, yeah. right? Not everybody is going to be the next Adele, right? Not everybody's going to be the next Kurt Cobain. So don't mm-hmm. try to make your voice be like somebody else, but rather find your voice, your stories that you have to tell and share your human experience through what your voice is, the thing that you were given when you came into this world. Yeah. And, you know, I think the more that we embrace all those unique colors and we don't try to turn people into things they're not, we can still bring down some of the, the damage and injuries that occur. I, I love that idea of sharing your own human experience and it speaks to something we speak about on this channel a lot. And uh, those of us who watch this channel a lot um, hear me constantly saying, singing is not about perfect notes, it's about communication. And I love the way you just put that. It's the sharing of your own human experience, which is so unique to every individual. No individual's um, history is the same as another. And uh, and uh, I love the way you phrase that. That's that's. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you know, and then it also comes back to genre as well. Is that yeah. I think it's also just appreciating and getting the teachers in the world to realize that if Mozart is what speaks to your heart, but Lamb of God speaks to the student's heart, they are both equally passionate about that music. And as teachers, we should help each one of those people move forward with what they want to do, instead of looking at one as being better or greater than the other. We. Uh, oh. We're, we're going to hang our hat on that because that is, that is just fabulous. And uh, I want to I just give a few moments to some Q&A, some very quick Q&A, if that's okay with you. And uh, mm-hmm. so let's come back after this and uh, we'll, we'll answer some questions that Linda has been so diligently collating for us and we'll come back in a sec. Okay, so, and I do just want to take a quick moment to thank you, Pers, because it is currently, what now, it's, it's 20, pa, 40, 20 to 1 a.m. in your part of yes. the woods. <laughs> it and, is, and so if I seem a little bit slow and, of thought, that would be why. And you were so <laughs> kind enough, you even went to your office so that you didn't have, um, you know, crying babies in the background, so... We, yes. everyone here, let me thank you on behalf of everyone here at the channel. We are very grateful for the time and the intention that you've put into spending with us today. Very uh, welcome. I'm happy to do it. Okay, so our first question comes from one of our regulars, Yuhui. Uh, when did it become commonly advisable for professional singers to have singing coaches? 
I know at one time they winged it. I think she's referring to contemporary singers there. Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I think that a lot of them probably winged it because there weren't enough people helping yeah. them. So, I mean, if you were, I mean, when I wanted to sing rock and roll, I couldn't find somebody to teach me to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was learning to sing music theater, there weren't a whole lot of musical theater specialists in my part of the world, in yeah. my part of, you know, the United yeah. States. Um, I know, you know, Seth Riggs was the big pioneer in starting to work with that L.A. crowd. Yeah. Um, Lisa Popeil is another person who's been working out there. Um, I would say, though, that it, it's taken a lot of time. Melissa Cross has been working in the New York scene of getting the death metal people to come to the table. Yes. Um, but you kind of had to find out about all those people by word of mouth. Yeah. And it's really in the last 10 years with the explosion of the Internet and YouTube mm -hmm. that um, these voices are getting out there. And so I feel like people have started relying or believing more in training for commercial music now that they know that it exists. Yeah. And now that there are people finding out that, you know, you can learn uh, uh, genre specific techniques, that it isn't just a one size fits all approach. Mm hmm. And so I would say to me, I realized 10 years ago, it was moving in a good direction. I feel like even in the last maybe three years, I've really seen it pick up. Wow. There's a lot more YouTube uh, voice teachers out there spreading the message, a lot more uh, conferences. I'm seeing a lot of teachers starting to go to continuing mm -hmm. education um, conferences and workshops yeah. to learn about these things. Yeah. And I think it's a really exciting time to be involved in the field as a teacher yes. and as a singer. Yeah. It, it is. It most certainly is. And uh, I think Australia's, you know, they say the old adage, you know, big ships turn slowly. Yes. The, the USA is a bigger ship than, than Australia. Um, here in Australia, I think at Nats have got nearly 10,000 or around 10,000 members. And Nats, which is the Australian uh, National Association, we have about, it, it oscillates around between four and 450, I think, 450 members. So I think we, we're a little bit Further down the track, um, our boat has turned a little bit quicker. I think it started to turn really in the early 2000s. And, and so there is a, a very well accepted um, approach to, to contemporary voice. Or what I, I prefer to, uh, we were talking about the, the choice of, of acronyms before. I, I prefer PCM, Popular Culture Musics, um, which yep. a, a friend of mine, uh, pro uh, Associate Professor Di Hughes from Macquarie Uni uses, and I, I, I like it particularly because my my doctorate was in contemporary worship singers, and so CCM has such a strong connection to not only contemporary um, church music but also um, uh, country, the country music scene. So CCM yeah. sort of has a clunky feel to me, but that's an aside. Let's go to a let's yeah. go to another question here. Matt is asking which is more of a risk to my voice, doing guttural metal metal screams or screaming like Bruce Dickinson and eighties metal singers. I mean, it depends. One of the things, it's very um, person specific. We're uh, if you watch a bunch of stroboscopies, you're going to see that there's all kinds of different um, makeup in their tissue. Some people have really large ventricular folds or false folds. Other people have smaller ones that aren't as visible. Yeah. Um, it seems that some people can make those guttural rally sounds easier than. Than others yes and this is something i'm interested in doing some research on and yeah. trying to stroke them you know highly successful uh growlers and screamers yes um i have a fairly wide open uh pharynx in there i can get my false folds together but you know it's not the same as some of my students who can easily suck those guys together sing a pitch underneath while they're making that growl sound yeah so what I would say is in that question is, which is, you know, easier or less strenuous on your voice. I think whatever one fits you. For yeah. me, the easiest thing to do is a fry scream. I can fry scream all day and it doesn't really wear me out. But as soon as I go to more of that growl or what uh, Melissa Cross calls death, you know, and I go for those sounds, that doesn't feel good. And there's, you know, I like to still play around in multiple genres. I'm sure if I focused all of my attention on doing death with my voice, I could get it down. Yeah. And but at the same time, if my anatomy isn't really constructed in a way yeah. that leans itself towards that style of singing, it's going to be a real struggle. Yeah. Just as you know, there's people whose voices don't lean themselves towards being a classical singer, and for them, it's a real struggle. Yeah. So I would say is you know experiment, play around with sounds. 
Um, if it gets tiring on you, take a break and try it in maybe two days later. Don't ever try to go sing until you're hoarse. Yeah, good. And you should also remember is that some of these people that you hear do have voice damage. Yeah. And that's the reason they sound that way. I have a student who's actually has been touring Europe uh, recently. Um, he's here from the Winchester area. He's got this uh, heavy metal bluegrass band. It's really awesome. <laughs> but he's got a really growly, raspy voice. And I was talking to him. I was like, how your voice get like this? He said, well, in high school, I was in a punk band and I used to go scream until I had no voice left. And then I'd wait till it came back and scream until I had no voice left. And that'll do and it. after practicing that way, eventually my voice got rough and gritty. I was like, okay, you know, and then he also smoked a lot. So yeah. that adds on top of it. Yeah. So all of these things have helped his voice sound that way. Mm. Now, you know, that was a choice and it's fine. We work with it and we yeah. have been able to help him, you know, use his voice effectively mm. and singing stuff that he likes. But I wouldn't necessarily tell a student who wants a gravelly voice to go do all those things to no. make your voice. Too. No, no. Yeah. So when you listen to some of these artists, you have to realize there may be things you don't know that they've done in their life or things that they were born with inside of their uh, larynx mm. that you can't replicate. So do you. And I think there's some exciting, uh, it will be interesting to see where our research takes us. Uh, because, for example, going back to the sports science idea, they are able now to go searching for particular morphologies that suit certain um, uh, disciplines of sports. So, for example, um, our Australian um, Olympic winning female rugby union sevens team um, mm -hmm. were, were collated from a range of different sports to play different roles within the team. And it will be interesting to see where our research takes us to be able to ascertain what what do we feel that person's physiology, that, that person's biological makeup leans, you know, leads towards? I think there's the complication of um, uh, our sense of who we are and do, for example, I, in my classical era as a singer, I was identified as a Baroque tenor. I had no connection with Baroque material whatsoever. So there is that, that aspect and I in, in went off and, and yeah. did you know, contemporary rock male vocal. So I think there's that personal connection, but it'll be interesting to see, won't it, that where our research takes us in identifying, oh, your voice looks like it will suit this. Um, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And there's, there's so many things that contribute to these conversation. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, what I always say is it's easy in conversations like this and in presentations to talk about the black and white, yes. this and that. Yes. But the reality of it is, is that there are many shades of gray and yes. most people live somewhere in that in middle the gray. Ground. Yes, yes, right? yes, and yes. It, live in the gray, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and embrace it. And the thing is in commercial music, it, there's also this difference I think in training is that in traditionally in classical music, there were expected norms. So you have this Fox system where you may yeah. be like a dramatic tenor or a lyric tenor, or like you said, a Baroque tenor. But in commercial music, there aren't necessarily expected norms. We don't need another Bob Dylan. No. Right? We, we don't, don't want another Bob. Bob Dylan. We don't. We already no. got him. Yeah. And so instead, we're looking for the next new thing. And the only way that we can find that is if singers are themselves and they put themselves forward. Yes. Yes. And kind of the yeah. others. And so yeah. to me, again, that's, you know, going back to accept who you are. That's yes. the voice you were given. Now figure out how to do something with it that you, you know, feel good about. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. I do want to, um, we've, we've, we've got other questions here and um, I, I want to give, uh, I want to quickly, just quickly go through two questions if we could. Uh, Linda has asked, are there any significant differences between coaching the female versus male voice, both in style and mechanics? Yes. Um, so women have it harder, I think. Um, and I enjoy working with female singers because I, uh, you know, I think a lot of times it's really frustrating to them that they have a very clear, distinct break between what uh, here in the States we call head voice yeah. and chest voice, yeah. right? Thin fold, thick fold, again, call it whatever you want. The vocal folds are either breathy and they're letting out a light sound or they're more firmly closed together and they're giving out yes. a harsher, edgier sound. Yes. Um, they have to learn how to bridge that gap yeah. and they have to carry that chest voice up above the traditional breaking point. And of it's that smack bang in the middle of their voice. That's the challenge. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 
And so you have to massage that area because if you don't do it carefully, they can end up getting, you know, nodules and women are prone to that kind of an injury that seems to be a little bit more than men. Yeah. That's where the research that I'm aware of has been that may be incorrect. There's a whole uh, lot of factors in there. Yeah. Uh, that contribute to that. Men aren't usually on the high end or going up to maybe a B or a C, which is again, you know, you're carrying this chest mechanism up. And in women and men, yes, the vocal folds are slightly different in size, yeah. but there's a lot of very much the same, right? There's a guy named Robert Edwin who talks about uh, gender neutral voice pedagogy, right? Okay. Because it's basically head and chest. It just depends on the breaking point and sure. how far you carry it okay. up. Men maybe carry it up to A, B, C, but women are trying to carry it up to F sharp and high yeah. notes. Yeah. What I tend to see is that men have an underdeveloped head voice. Yes. They don't ever sing the falsetto. Yes, right? yes, yes. And you have to get them moving that so that they can have high notes because they just want to shove things up yeah. and they won't get the high notes. And women don't know how to deal with the break, so they will either shout and then flip over flip it. or they've yeah. been told all of their life that that's your you know chest voice don't use that it's like they've been voice shamed yeah told yeah. not to use the thing that's natural to them yeah and so they're afraid of it and they don't want to play with it yeah and they've heard all of these rumors and these uh stories that aren't true about you know chest voice being damaging it's yes, not true yeah, it's not true it's damaging if it's done poorly yeah but when done correctly it's just fine yeah. Essentially, what we're doing is we're teaching the women to sing like men and the men to sing a little bit more like women. Yeah. Right. So the men who tend to want to go on ah, and carry their chest up, you have to teach them to bring in a little bit more head into that upper voice, especially pop singers. Yeah. I think about like Justin Timberlake and how much and he uses up there in that mm -hmm. lighter sound and Sam Smith. Yeah. Um, and then you're teaching women to carry their chest voice up higher than normal, more like a tenor does. Yeah. And they approach yeah. Um, as far as style wise and teaching them on the style side of things, you know, it depends. And again, you get into stereotypes. Um, it seems to be to me that I see a lot. I don't know. It's a, you know, it, we all, we tend to go towards stereotypes and they're not necessarily true, but I find that a lot of my high school male singers are coming in and it's like, you know, raw agitation, teenage angst. Uh, trying to blow down the wall. So we end up working on a lot of rhythmically based stuff, uh, really figuring out how to tap into the rhythm and the drive and using the words to, you know, communicate those angsty feelings. And then a lot of my female singer songwriters are more communicating stories. Yeah. And then as we're working on, you know, their vocal styling, you're looking at what, you know, their story is and what they're trying to say. Yeah. I'm finding that those stereotypes are being just blown out of the water more and more. I feel like when I was, uh, you know, a young performer, it was a lot more clear, but now we're really moving away from that. So I would say really in a lot of ways, you're not doing a whole lot different. Again, you're trying to focus on who are you? What are you trying to say? And are the choices you're making going along with that uh, story that you want to tell? Mm -hmm. The mechanics, mm -hmm. though, they're the ones where we tend to see more of the differences. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I'm just, I'm just going to let XP Nova and Dylan, I can see your questions there, but we have run out of time. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to your questions. Uh, we will have, uh, we've got another guest next week. So maybe if you tune in and you'll be able to, uh, Dylan and, and XP, I'll try to um, give, give uh, some priority to your questions. I'm so, sorry we didn't get to them. We just, we have literally run out of time and I'm just so appreciative of, uh, of your time, uh, Matt, and, and uh, spending. Uh, as I knew, I knew that I would just, uh, I'd be like just nodding my whole way through. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the mutual admiration society here. So, uh, look, yeah. thank you very much for your time and, uh, and your, as I said, your, your being up to all hours. Um, welcome to Monday, by the way. Um, yeah, I know, right? I yeah, you're I'm here. It is weird calling you from Sunday in the United States to Monday in Australia. Uh, I've never done that before, and, so that was exciting. There, it's, it's no, but cool. you're doing great things, a great YouTube channel, and thank you for uh, having me and, and inviting me to be a part of it. Thank you very much, and I'll just, I'll just um, close up. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, wasn't that a treat? Uh, look, make sure you share this video with all of your socials. So many people are going to get so much out of what... Um, Associate Professor Dr. Matthew Edwards. Do we put the doctor in there? I don't know. 
uh, what Matt has said for us. And uh, look, um, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, if you've been watching this as a replay, leave your comments and questions uh, in, the, in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, we have another guest next week, Mark Baxter, has got a, a great channel and uh, is a friend of mine. Um, he's going to be joining us next week, so make sure you tune in again at 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time every Monday. Hit the subscribe button, hit the white bell icon, and make sure you join in. We love hanging out here. This is an awesome community of singers from across the globe who, just like you, want to raise their voice in song. I look forward to seeing you in the next Voice Essentials video. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.